Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar that's offered jointly by the Mobilize Center and the Restore Center at Stanford University. Um, my name is Matt Petrucci. I'm the scientific program manager of both these centers, and I'm excited to be your moderator today. Today's speaker is Jess Selinger, who will be discussing her recent work using big data from wearables and in-lab energetics data to explain running speeds in the wild. Uh, the first part of our webinar will cover her research study, and the second part will be a review of the best practices uh, she used for analyzing big data from wearables. Now, today's webinar is brought to you by the Mobilize Center and the Restore Center, which are both supported by the National Institutes of Health. The Mobilize Center is focused on developing and disseminating state-of-the-art biomechanics and machine learning tools for researchers uh, to analyze human movement. The Restore Center is working to make these, these and other tools for real-world assessment of movement more widely available to the rehab research community. Before we get started, a couple of quick reminders about the format of the webinar. Uh, we will have the research talk and then the best practices session, and we'd love for you to, to or we'd love to take questions from both of them. Uh, we'll take your questions at the end of the research talk and at the end of the best practices session. So we'll do two separate Q and A's. Uh, please type your questions into the Q&A panel in, the, in, in Zoom, and so not the chat, but I'll put them in the Q&A panel, and we'll re review them from there. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Jessica Selinger is an assistant professor in kinesiology and health studies at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. She received her PhD in the Department of Biomedical uh, Physiology and Kinesiology at Simon Fraser University, in 2016, uh, where her doctoral work was funded by the Veneer Graduate Fellowship or Scholarship. Sorry. From 2016 to 2018, she was a distinguished postdoctoral fellow at uh, Stanford University and the Mobilize Center. Uh, her research is focused on understanding the fundamental principles that underlie the neuromechanics of legged motion and the applications of these principles to wearable and assistive technologies that can improve human mobility and overall health. Uh, with that, I'm very excited to have uh, Jess with uh, with and uh, talk to you all today, and for joining us. And uh, I'll let uh, Jess go ahead and begin. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Uh, can you see my screen, Matt? Do you want to just let me know? Great. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining me today. Uh, as Matt mentioned, this webinar is going to be broken down into two parts. Uh, and in this first part of my talk, I'm going to discuss the scientific motivation for this work, what our primary findings were, and what their importance and implications are. Uh, now, for those who are interested and want to stay on for the second half of the webinar, I'm going to take a deeper dive into the data analysis process and share some tips and lessons I've learned when working with these sorts of large-scale physical activity data sets. Okay, so uh, this figure, it was published in 1981 in Nature by Hoyt and Taylor, um, is probably my all-time favorite figure uh, in any paper. And it's largely what inspired the study that I'm gonna talk to you about here today. So in this experiment, uh, the authors trained horses to walk, trot, and gallop at a range of speeds on a treadmill. So you can see the speeds here on the x-axis. And then they measured the horse's oxygen consumption or energy consumption shown here on the y-axis while they're walking and trotting and galloping on these treadmills. And then what they found were these bowls that you see here, these three different bowls of data. And that indicates that for these horses, there is a particular speed at which it is energetically most efficient to walk, to trot, and to gallop. Now, next what they did is they actually just observed these horses moving naturally out in the real world, out in the field. And what they found is that those horses actually preferred to move at speeds that correspond to each of these three minimums. So that's shown in these black histograms here. And what you see is that those horses actually entirely avoid these more intermediate speeds here, presumably because they are costlier. So what I really like about this study is this combination of experimental testing in the lab with observation of more natural or ecological behavior. And 
I think the recent proliferation of wearable devices where we can sort of track and monitor our movement in the background create this new opportunity for us to do just that in humans. So to partner experimental measures with real world observations. Now, what I'm showing you here is this same horse data in the dashed line, but then I'm also overlaying uh, data from humans in the solid line. And so you'll see here that while horses have those three gates, the walk, the trot, and the gallop, we have just two, which you probably know, our walk and our run. And it's really well established that we have this energy minimal speed, which we choose to walk at. So the bottom of this bowl here. But what you'll notice is that for running, we have this flat line. And so for a long time, human runners have long been thought to consume a near constant amount of energy expenditure per unit distance traveled, regardless of the speed we're traveling at. So if I'm traveling slower or faster, I burn roughly the same number of calories and we get this sort of flat looking line. And this has been hypothesized to allow human runners to adapt their speed to different task demands with little or no energetic consequence. So for example, there's a lot of hypotheses about how in long distance hunting, this trait might have allowed our early ancestors to adapt their running speed to be least economical for their prey. So for 50 years, this line is assumed to be relatively flat, but there are these recent experiments by Wall Scheffler and her group that more carefully measure the energy expenditure across different running speeds. And those studies indicate that there may actually be an energy optimal running speed. So this line may actually have a bowl shape to it after all. So here in this study, our objective was to test these two competing hypotheses by characterizing runners' real-world preferred speeds and determining if our preferences were consistent with task or energy-dependent objectives. So in other words, is preferred speed adapted based on the task at hand, say the distance that you're running, or instead, um, does speed remain relatively unchanged and consistent across task, and is it consistent with this idea of energy minimization? And so that's what we're setting out to test in this study. Now, to test these competing hypotheses, we partnered with Lumo Run to analyze data collected from their commercial GPS-enabled smartphone app and its accompanying IMU sensor. And the really nice thing about doing that is that the subset of data that we're able to analyze includes data from over 4,500 runners, over 37,000 runs uh, from a pretty broad range of demographics. So if I took all of that running time series data and I stacked it up together, I'd be looking at over three years worth of continuous running data, uh, which would take me a lifetime to collect in the lab. Um, <clears throat> now, the sensor and the phone can estimate a number of kinematic measures while we're running, but in the study here today, we're just going to focus on uh, the speed and distance that, uh, that runners are running at. So we're going to be looking at the data from the phone GPS metrics. So with this data, we're going to run two main analyses to answer our research question. So the first is to determine if runners choose different speeds for different tasks. And what we do there is we select runners who run at least one run at three different distances. So in this case, a two mile, a four mile, and a six mile run. We then use a repeated measures ANOVA where we can control for differences between runners to test if there are differences in the runner's average speed across these different distance tasks. Um, the runs that we choose to include here are the most commonly runs that we find in our data set, and they're varying from 20 minutes in length to over two hours in length. Now, the second analysis, we're seeking to determine if runners' preferred speeds are consistent with energy minimization. And so there we compare preferred running speeds of age, gender, and BMI match runners from our free living data set to experimentally determined energetic optima for, from participants in a lab setting. Now, I wanna take just a minute and explain what this experimental lab data looks like. So here we pooled data from three different lab studies that gave us a total of 26 participants, 10 female and 16 male. Um, these were largely fit and college age participants. And then each of those participants run on a treadmill at a range of speeds. It was either five or six speeds, depending on the protocol. Those speeds range between 1.8 meters per second and 4.9 meters per second. They run at each speed for five minutes. 
and they repeat those feeds in a different randomized order on at least three different testing dates. Now, while they're running on that treadmill, we're instrumenting them with indirect calorimetry, so the mask you see there, which allows us to measure oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production and get an estimate of energy expenditure. So this is a very similar setup to what those horses had in the lab. And we can then take that data and calculate the energy expenditure someone is burning per unit distance that they travel. We call this the cost of transport. Uh, and then we can get these uh, poles for each participant and we can solve for what is their energy optimal speed here at the bottom. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the results and I'll start with our first question. Do runners adapt their speed based on the task or the distance that they're running? So do I run shorter if I know I'm running a short distance versus a long distance? Here I'm plotting all data from all of the runs in our free living data set. So collected from the wearable. And you have here, you have time. So how long the run was on the uh, X axis. And then you have the average running speed of that run on the Y axis. And so each one of these gray dots is a run in our data set. And when you plot the data like this, what probably a lot of you are noticing are there these striations or curves that we see in the data. And I, I remember at first when I plotted this, I thought maybe it was an artifact or I wasn't quite sure what that was. Um, but what this is, is this is people targeting commonly run distances. So things like a 5K or a three mile run, we get clusters of runs at those uh, distances. So, Recall in this analysis, we are gonna select runners that run at least one run at each of three distances. So the two mile, <clears throat> the four mile, and the six mile. And then we use the repeated measures and we're looking for, are there different differences in their speed across these runs? And what we actually find is that even for this threefold change in distance, there are no differences in runners preferred speeds. And we can look at that data as a histogram as well, and we see no systematic shift in the distribution as we change the distance that they're running. Now, we wanted to ensure this analysis wasn't biased towards runners who could cover or would cover this breadth of distance. So we repeated the same analysis, but here we looked at runners who ran shorter distances. So we took runners who ran uh, a one mile, a two mile, and a three mile run. Uh, and what we find again is that there were no differences in their preferred speed across these changes in the distance or the task. Now, we also looked at runners who ran longer runs, so the five, six, and seven mile runs. And here what we find is that only for the longest distance, so that seven mile run, we get a very small decrease in runners' uh, preferred speed. So across all run distances, uh, runners vary their average speed by only about 5% with no clear trend across run distance. So now we think runners have a particular preferred speed, which they don't adapt based on the task or the distance. The next question is, is that preferred speed that they're selecting, is it consistent with energy minimization? So here we're kind of back to that horse experiment. So what I'm showing you now is we have average energy expenditure curves that were collected from that lab data. So here, this is for females, and this is averaged across those 10 participants. And what I'm showing you at the bottom is our 95% confidence interval in where that minimum lies across all these participants. Um, we then pull gender, age, and BMI matched individuals. In this case, it was females aged about 16 to 27, BMI 17 to 28, from our free living data set. So here what I'm doing is highlighting each of the runs from those particular runners, which we're pulling out of this larger data set. Uh, we can then plot a histogram of preferred speeds for those runners. And what we find is that the average free living preferred speed is indistinguishable from the average preferred energy optimal speed. Now we can run the same analysis with different populations of runners. So for example, we can also look at male runners um, who have a different and higher energy optimal running speed. And so now we're pulling a different subset of runs from this large database. And once again, we find really nice consistency between preferred and energy optimal speeds. So 
runners' preferred speeds are largely unaffected by the distance they run, and they're consistent with the speeds that minimize energy expenditure. Uh, intuitively, I think a lot of us assume that we run faster for shorter distances and then slow our pace for longer distances. That's consistently found in competitive races where minimizing time is your explicit goal. But it turns out when we're just out for a jog and not a race, minimizing energy is the subconscious goal. And as a result, our average speed is surprisingly constant regardless of run distance. So overall, when we go for a run, although a goal might be to burn calories, we actually move at a speed to minimize them. And this is actually really consistent with the free living preferences of other non-human animals for energy optimal locomotion, be that those galloping horses I talked about earlier, or swimming fish, or even flying birds. So although human experiments had long demonstrated that minimizing energy expenditure was this really important objective during steady state walking, this work was really the first to show that this objective remains really paramount in running and in ecological context, despite complex terrains, um, competing objectives. So I think this is really of importance to biomechanists like myself who are seeking to understand and model human locomotion, um, anthropologists who are trying to understand the evolution of our gait, uh, roboticists and rehabilitation specialists designing assistive devices for locomotion, and of course, coaches and sports medicine practitioners who are training and rehabilitating athletes. So um, I wanna thank uh, my co-authors, so Rachel Jackson, Jennifer Hicks, and Scott Delp from the Stanford Mobilize Center. Uh, I also want to thank Dr. Kara Wall Scheffler for sharing her experimental data, as well as Derek Chang and the whole Lumo Run team for sharing the free living data set. Um, a reminder for those of you who are interested, there is a part two to the webinar today. Um, there are so many details related to this study that I didn't touch on in this talk. Um, for example, how we prepare and clean up this large and messy data set, um, how we perform that runner and participant matching, or how we try to challenge the robustness of some of these conclusions. Um, and so for those of you who are more interested in hearing about some of these more data science aspects of the study, um, do please stick around for part two. Um, so thank you. And with that, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Jess. Uh, super clear talk. Um, now we'll go ahead and start the Q&A session. So again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A panel, uh, not the chat, and we'll get to uh, as many as we can. Uh, we'll take about five, 10 minutes, uh, uh, five or 10 minutes, and then we'll switch over to the second half of the talk. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the Q&A. Um, I guess I have a quick question. Um, would do you expect these energy minimums to change for someone who's maybe like a high performance athlete in terms of uh, someone training to do marathons or longer uh, longer run types? Yeah. Um, that's a great, uh, a really great question. So um, we know that when people train and they increase their um, sort of performance capacity that um, they can certainly run, run much faster and have sort of higher race times and whatnot. But it's actually unclear what that would do to someone's underlying cost landscape. Um, mm. And so whether or not that would shift the energy optimal speed. If you're picturing that bowl, there's sort of a variety of things that could happen with avid training. It's possible that your energy expenditure sort of lowers down regardless of the speed that you're running at. And in that case, yeah, it's just imagine taking that bowl and shifting mm. it directly down. Mm. And in that case, your energy optimal speed actually wouldn't change. It's just you're operating. It doesn't cost you as much to be running. Um, but it's also possible that with training or training at higher speeds, you get kind of a, a warping or a shifting of the bowl where certain um, speeds become more efficient than others. And that optimum does change. Um, but there's actually not great data on what improving your um anaerobic capacity does to these underlying cost landscapes. And so that's actually a project um, one of the PhDs in my lab is, is planning to tackle in the coming term. Awesome. Yeah. Very interesting, very interesting. 
Uh, so look, we have a couple questions that have come in. Uh, first one is from uh, Subra Manyam uh, Mura Mala. Sorry if I uh, mispronounced uh, your name. Uh, how are we sure of the data quality since it is out in the wild? Because we'll cover yeah. the second part of the talk, but maybe a, a quick. Yeah. Answer. So I um I would certainly encourage you to stick around for the second part of the talk. Um, and um, because there's there's kind of all sorts of steps that we take um, to try and, and be sure of that. And so part of that has to do with the kinds of criteria we set up to initially sort of clean and, and filter out data and get rid of um, runs where maybe we're, we're missing data or they're not actually runs. Maybe someone left it on when they're in their car or um, you know, they were cycling or walking. Um, and then there's all kinds of, you know, other steps that I'm going to talk about here in terms of before you run your main analysis is making sure that you can reproduce um, expected or known trends in that data. So there's certain things we know, you know, should be true if the data is, is good. And so we, we do things like check those. And, and I'm going to dive into a lot of that um, in the second part of the talk. Great. Great. Uh, second question coming in from uh, Abed Abu uh, Hale. Uh, so horses had three ener energy minimas, and it was believed that humans had two, with one being a straight line. How many minimas uh, was it shown for humans to actually have? I guess, are there multiple minimas for energy optimization? Yeah. I see. Yeah. So, um, so we now kind of understand that we have those bowls for both walking and running. And in human locomotion, those are our two primary um, primary gates. And so, you know, again, while horses have that walk and the trot and the gallop, we tend to either just have the walk or the run. So I would say we have two. Um, having said that, you can uh, ask that people do sort of odd or different kinds of, of gates, some sort of like sort of skipping form and jumping. And, uh, and so within those, there may also be energy minimums. But in terms of what we actually are going to see in a sort of more natural ecological context, it's going to be the walk or the run there. Awesome. Okay, great. Uh, next question is from Jesse Charlton. Uh, by taking the average speed across the whole run, do you think uh, we might miss information of speed choice within a run, such as starting fast and finishing slow or vice versa? And any thoughts on how we could incorporate this with uh, within run data in any analysis that you're doing like this? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think um, there there are definitely there is variation um, within any run around the speed that you're going to select. Um, and there's actually been recently some really interesting work that looks at um, people's choices around walk run mixtures and, and how they vary their speed and how some of the choices they make there also appear to be um, energy optimal choices. Um, so I think uh, you know, that's that's something I, I spent uh, quite a bit of time sort of looking at and thinking about. It didn't end up becoming part of the, the main sort of story that we present here. Um, but in the second half, I will also talk about how we do have runs with that kind of um, wider or less variation. We have runs in some cases where people are maybe doing something more like interval training, which we're going to, you know, we filter out for this particular study. Um, and it's definitely the case that in some of those longer runs, you're you're going to have fatigue effects hitting. And I think that's where we see that small differences in speed when we get to, to longer distances where things like fatigue and thermal regulation come into play. Great. And one more question we can sneak in before starting the next section. Um, <clears throat> with this efficient speed preference, um, might runners train their our cardio cardiovascular system by running slower than preferred. Yeah, so I think if I if I understand the question properly, maybe what you're envisioning is that um, you're sorry. operating a bowl. And sorry, what was that, Matt? Uh, sorry, I forgot to say the name. It was Ricky P uh, Pimentel. Was, okay, was thanks, question. Ricky. <laughs> um, I think what you're, if I could just rephrase the question, I think so. If you're operating at a minimum in a bowl and you were looking to kind of um, train your cardiovascular system more or burn more calories or whatnot, one option, right, is to run faster and then you're operating at a higher energy expenditure point. Um, but the other, if you're in the bottom of the bowl, is actually to run slower. And then you're also operating at a, at a higher energy point. Again, keeping in mind, this is 
if you're going to cover a set distance. So you've determined ahead of time you're going to run that distance. You would technically, given this data, burn more calories if you ran slower or faster than your preferred. Uh, if you were running a set time, that is not true. You would burn more calories when you're running faster if you were going to cover one set time. <laughs> 